I think it's kind of figuring out, are these data representative? Are they being studied in the right communities and diverse communities across the country? And then are the data being reported in a way that people who don't have specialized knowledge of virology and, and viral concentrations, you know, can they make sense of this data to quickly act on it and, and to guide pandemic response? I'm JB Wogan from Mathematica, and welcome back to On the Evidence, a show that examines what we know about today's most urgent challenges and how we can make progress in addressing them. On this episode, we're talking about the use of wastewater testing for monitoring the spread of the novel coronavirus known as SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19, plus its viral variants like Delta and Omicron. And what we'll be exploring in this episode specifically is whether this valuable public health tool, which has expanded in use during the pandemic, can also advance equity. A little background is in order. About 80% of U.S. households are connected to a sewer system. People infected with SARS-CoV-2 and its variants shed the virus when they go to the bathroom, and that includes asymptomatic people who may not even know that they are infected. Before the pandemic, staff at almost 15,000 wastewater treatment plants around the country were already collecting samples to detect pollutants in sewage and storm runoff. With the arrival of COVID-19, many municipalities turned to this existing infrastructure to conduct rapid, repeated, community-wide viral testing. In some places, wastewater testing has functioned as an early warning system, alerting local public health officials about new infections in the community. Wastewater testing for infectious disease, sometimes described as wastewater epidemiology, is not new. In the past, it has helped detect outbreaks of pathogens like poliovirus and typhoid. But public health officials are still learning how to make the most of the data when dealing with a pandemic. To that end, the Rockefeller Foundation's Pandemic Prevention Institute has established a wastewater action group. As the name suggests, the group's mission is to translate wastewater data into public health action through collaboration. The group includes leading researchers and public health officials in tribal nations, as well as four U.S. cities, Atlanta, Houston, Louisville, and Tulsa. One of the broad questions the Wastewater Action Group is grappling with is, how do we use wastewater testing in an equitable way? To the extent that this can be a valuable tool for preventing disease spread, how do we make sure that all communities benefit? And for communities whose residents have been at higher risk of infection, severe illness, and death during the pandemic, but who also have good reason to be skeptical about any new surveillance or collection of their data, how can we ensure wastewater testing helps rather than harms those communities? My guests for this episode are wrestling with those exact questions. Otak Conroy Ben is an assistant professor of environmental engineering at Arizona State University, and Nataki Osborne Jelks is an assistant professor in environmental and health sciences at Spelman College. Otak and Nataki are two of the researchers involved in the Wastewater Action Group, and they are part of wastewater testing initiatives in the American Southwest, the Northern Great Plains, and the Atlanta metro area. My third guest, Aparna Keshavaya, is a principal researcher at Mathematica who has led wastewater-based research in Montana and North Carolina and is currently providing technical assistance to the Rockefeller Foundation and its Wastewater Action Group. I began the interview by asking Otak to explain how the tribal nations she's working with are using wastewater testing to inform public health decisions. So I work in tribal communities, primarily in the Western United States, and we have been collecting wastewater probably since the mid-2000s, um, a few months after the pandemic started. And in our particular project, we're looking at the trends ongoing uh, when it comes to COVID concentration levels. So we would actually be looking to see if the levels increase or decrease and in that way, we can inform the utilities as well as the health department, health administrators, 
um, you know, maybe what to expect when it comes to clinical cases. Nataki, what about you? Where, where are you working? Which communities do you serve? And how are you using the COVID-19 wastewater data to serve them? I am working uh, in the city of Atlanta. I am a professor and researcher at Spelman College, um, which is on the west side of Atlanta, but working with a team out of Emory University and the Global Center for Safe Water. The group at Emory has been engaged in this wastewater surveillance work for several months now. And they are looking really at different parts of the city, working in collaboration with the city of Atlanta's Department of Watershed Management. Um, And we've been engaged in conversations with our local health departments, the Fulton County Health Department, um, as well as the local school system, the Atlanta public school system. And what our hope is, um, is to use this data to inform ultimately uh, community members, community organizations, including communities of faith who are you know, it seems like have been on pins and needles trying to figure out, you know, the right approach to things like reentry. You know, they're trying to get a grasp of, you know, what COVID positivity rates look like in our community. You know, what's the level of community spread? And while we know that we can look to tools like diagnostic testing, um, we also, you know, recognize that this more passive uh, surveillance can also give us some key information about what's happening in our community. Um, we're also, you know, working with, in addition to local government, you know, working uh, with um, local school systems and and really trying to share that data. There's a lot of interest, you know, in this data as schools are being faced with the decisions that they need to make or to maintain to keep, you know, kids safe in school. So for us, it's really all about um, being able to uh, understand what's happening Um, share that information with the community and co-create, you know, with these various entities in the community, um, ways that they want to, you know, be able to utilize this information to inform their decision making. Okay, great. And you you mentioned communities of faith. I'm just curious, are there special considerations, anything specific to communities of faith in terms of their, first of all, heightened concerns around COVID-19, but also why they might be more eager to return to normal? This, you know, in in my experience as someone who belongs to a community of faith, you know, in the Atlanta area, even throughout Georgia, you know, there are some key concerns really, you know, when we go back to the very early days of the, uh, of the pandemic uh, in South Georgia, um, we actually had some, you know, hot spots in Albany, Georgia, for instance, um, that were tied to, a couple of funerals that had happened on one day um, where, you know, folks who attended those funerals, you know, many of them contracted COVID and some people ended up, you know, dying from that infection. So for churches uh, and, and other communities of faith, this is this has been a real issue. You know, how do you pull people together and, and kind of part of the foundation of Uh, these faith communities is the ability to be in fellowship with one another, to be in person um, and to be connected. So a lot of communities of faith have had to take their worship services, um, prayer meetings, et cetera, you know, online, which, you know, is sort of, it kind of goes against the grain in terms of, you know, being a part of a community of faith. And and it's something that um, these faith communities have had to do Um, But it's been challenging. You know, when the weather is nice, you see, you know, a lot of faith communities having some services and activities outdoors. But when when uh, we're in the winter or, you know, when we're having inclement weather, it's not it's not as feasible to do those things. So churches uh, and other communities of faith are really I think there is this heightened awareness, heightened sensitivity because they would, you know, like to get back to business as usual. And and some churches and faith communities have, you know, they have returned, but they, you know, in most cases have, you know, protocols in place and, you know, they are asking themselves, you know, what more can they do to, you know, to make sure that their congregations, you know, are safe, that their parishioners are safe. And in some cases, when we've seen some of the surges happen, you know, you may have had some faith communities or individual churches or mosques or synagogues that had planned to reopen, but because of, you know, surges with the Delta variant and then later with the Omicron variant, they had to dial back some of those plans because they were not as confident, you know, given the level of community spread that it was safe to get people back together, even, you know, using 
public health measures and protocols. So this community has been hit really hard, you know, kind of, you know, like schools were hit really hard. And now we've, you know, gotten our kids back in school, but, you know, the churches and uh, faith communities um, not are, are not all back just yet. Okay, that's really helpful. Aperna, you've been involved in piloting wastewater testing for COVID-19 in your home state of North Carolina. How are the counties in your area using information from wastewater testing? And how does it supplement other kinds of information public health officials in your state are monitoring? Yeah, so I live in the mountains in Western North Carolina. And since the summer of 2020, we have been working with officials in Jackson County, who I'm proud to say were were actually one of the first, were the first in the region and one of the first across the state to leverage wastewater testing for pandemic management. And it's been really an incredibly successful collaboration, in part because partnerships that are needed between the public health department, the utility, and local government officials came really easy here. You know, this is a a rural region with relatively small communities, and and community is really valued in in the Appalachian Mountains. And so that was kind of an easy thing to, to launch here. On a weekly basis, we are sending the Jackson County Department of Public Health memos that describe trends in wastewater viral concentrations. And we've heard that they've tailored communications to the public based on the fact that wastewater data have provided an early warning to them of new outbreaks, of entry of the Delta variant. And really, their use of wastewater data aligns with results from a national wastewater survey that we recently administered. So we we launched the survey to assess the role of wastewater surveillance and pandemic management and surveyed about 200 public health agencies across the country. And what we heard is that public health agencies most commonly have been using wastewater data to tailor communications to the public. And then secondarily, they've also used the data to inform how to adapt testing and mobile vaccination to communities that need it most. Uh, Otak, a part of mentioned that Jackson County embraced wastewater testing for this purpose. And I, I'm curious, with the communities that you're, you're working with, what is the reception like? What is the per- perception of wastewater testing? Uh, how, how do people feel about using this way of monitoring the sort of the crests and falls of COVID-19? I would say with the tribal communities that I'm working with, um, there has been mixed reception, but more often the case is the tribes are welcoming of this uh, type of methodology to, uh, you know, collect wastewater and inform uh, community health levels. When uh, we started to reach out to tribal communities, we have to go through a process, obviously, of uh, approvals and, and coordinating with the utility and the health department. But for uh, tribal communities, it's a bit more involved because of the hesitancy to conduct research and surveillance. And so we do have to go through IRB or their tribal council to get this type of approval. We actually started uh, wastewater surveillance with a particular particular tribe Uh, in 2017. And they enthusiastically um, welcomed this type of monitoring because it was non-invasive and it was not, we were not requesting biospecimens, which tribal communities are hesitant about, um, just testing urine, blood, um, and so forth. And so they thought that this was a way to, you know, get to that uh, health information, that health data stream for looking at uh, drugs of abuse, um, other infectious diseases, and pollutant exposure. Where I've had tribes kind of shy away from this is really more related to staffing. Uh, There are not enough wastewater personnel to assist with sampling. One tribe didn't think that this data would really help them through the pandemic, that um, they were monitoring um, trends with their own clinical testing. Uh, And for other tribes, um, you know, they welcome this type of research, but perhaps they don't have research protocols in place. And so we really can't assist them without having those legalities between the tribe and an academic institution detailed. 
before we start sampling. But I would say overall, tribes, you know, they they recognize that this is innovative and um, wh wherever they can, they, they do try to implement this. Okay. And I was reading about your work on wastewater epidemiology in an article on the University of Notre Dame's website where you earned a bachelor's degree in chemistry, I also learned. And you make the point in the article that there could be some mistrust between tribes and researchers because of historical examples of researchers misusing tribal members' data. And because of that history, you say that researchers today need to take time to rebuild that trust and make sure that the data is ultimately handed back to the tribes. Is that a feature of your wastewater work here? Do the tribal nations get to decide what happens with the data and how they are used? Exactly. In general, tribes have the right to, um, to they have their own um, data sovereignty policies or data sharing, data ownership. And if any data is collected within their reservation boundary, and some even with tribal members, like if you interview a tribal member, that information uh, is owned by the tribe. And uh, as a researcher, I recognize that uh, federal agencies do as well, ASU does. And so, you know, we generate this data, um, we share the data back with them. In the IRB, they may specify how that data can or cannot be shared. And that's the reason why, you know, I don't mention the tribes I'm working with, nor have we shared publicly the data. There is a case, a paper will be coming out soon on a wastewater study where the tribe is anonymized, the data is available, but the data, uh, the hard data, um, original data is with the tribe. Okay. And I believe I read in, in one of the news releases that, or one of the articles, uh, there was a story of the, the surrounding communities having a decline in COVID-19, but it turning out that in one of the tribal communities, the, the, the decline wasn't happening and it allowed uh, allowed for a response and sort of focused resources for that community? Yes. So in this particular tribal community, you know, it's a, it's, you know, a, a community of, you know, three or four towns, very small towns, and they lumped all of the data um, from that region into, uh, you know, a single line. And the the clinical cases showed that, you know, there's not really an issue um, for this particular tribe. But when we sampled the wastewater, uh, the, a specific sewer line from one of the uh, towns, from one of the housing subdivisions basically, showed very elevated levels compared to the other communities we were collecting from. So we were able to um, discuss with the utility and health director what was going on. Interesting. All right, Nataki, sorry, I, I went deep with a talk for a second there, but I'm curious, are, are there parallels in Atlanta in terms of the considerations the, the, uh, when, when you begin wastewater testing in the community? What, how, and how has the community perceived and, and received the use of wastewater testing? Well, in Atlanta, I would, you know, largely say that there is some curiosity uh, around wastewater surveillance. Um, some people see it as something that, you know, seems innovative, pretty interesting. But I'll be honest in saying that, you know, our work is, is still very early uh, in terms of the community engagement stages around it. So the wastewater surveillance work has started, you know, in part with some partnerships with local government, um, you know, happening kind of, um, you know, using water from the influent lines coming into wastewater treatment plants, for instance. But as we talk about some of the monitoring or surveillance that's happening or starting to happen, you know, within communities kind of near schools, you know, from uh, getting samples from manholes, et cetera. You know, this is the time that this, you know, conversation has begun, you know, with these other entities just to understand, you know, how receptive they would be. So, you know, a lot of the institutions, you know, like the school system, for instance, you know, is very interested, you know, in the data, uh, wanting to, you know, have data um, close, you know, to the schools to, you know, understand what might be happening, you know, in the schools but still on the community side of things, um, you know, we're, we're just early on in this process. And so part of our work here in Atlanta is to engage community champions, 
to really talk through these issues with them to understand, you know, what their concerns are um, with respect to, you know, how close this testing gets to, you know, uh, various, you know, communities of concern. Um, and so we want to be, you know, very open minded, you know, about hearing those concerns. You know, I, I believe that, you know, based on my experience, you know, working um, at the grassroots community level, doing a lot of community based participatory research and just community engaged research in general. You know, what I believe we'll see is, is probably a mixed reception as well. Some folks who will, you know, again, be very curious about it, um, think it's very innovative, but there may also be some concerns just about the over surveillance of our communities. Um, many of the communities that I work in, you know, in uh, the Atlanta area, when you talk about communities of color, um, when we talk about low income communities, many communities feel very, very overstudied yet underserved at the same time. So there will be, I'm sure, questions around, you know, once we have this data, you know, what will it change? How can it be used to direct resources or to inform decision making in a way that will improve the health of the community. So those are the types of things that I anticipate people will be, you know, very concerned about. Um, and I think that the, you know, as you know, the word gets out a little bit more, and community organizations and community residents are, you know, engaged fully. That there'll be both, you know, that curiosity and interest, you know, as well as you know some concerns about, you know how we can really use this data in a meaningful way and how we can also make sure that communities aren't harmed, that they aren't stigmatized, that they are not further marginalized in any ways um, as a result of what might come from um, our read of the data. I think what one other piece of context that might be helpful for listeners is to know that while we're talking about COVID, we're talking about wastewater testing in the context of monitoring the rise and fall of COVID-19 and its variants that the same tools can be used for other purposes, including the presence of illicit substances or drugs like opioids, and that there might be different feelings about sort of being lifted up as a community or a neighborhood that has a spike in, in drug use, that there might be sort of additional stigmas or different stigmas and, and undesirability there about being identified in a public way with that kind of data. Yeah, I mean that that registers with with our experience at Mathematica. We we actually began wastewater surveillance um, during the opioid epidemic because we heard that that communities were lacking good data on on drug use in communities um, and in the U.S. as a whole. In I think it was the late 1990s, early 2000s, the Office of National Drug Control Policy did a pilot test of wastewater surveillance um, for capturing community drug use. And they found that it was incredibly valuable uh, because it, it provides information on amounts and types of drugs used, kind of the mix in a community and how that changes. But there was a real concern when you don't have broad surveillance in place and you kind of have the spotlight surveillance that communities can be stigmatized by the results. And so I think there's still a, a real need to develop ethical frameworks in this field. Maybe it's been less relevant for, for COVID because it is so widespread, but, but you're right that with drug use and other kind of stigmatized behaviors, it's a greater, more salient concern. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you, Aparna. So getting back to, to the use for COVID, there are other ways of monitoring the prevalence of COVID in communities. I'm wondering how is wastewater testing helpful in areas where there is limited or inequitable access to uh, other kinds of, to to say individualized diagnostic tests for COVID? And maybe I don't think we've maybe we'll go back to Otak because I think uh, we just heard from Nataki and Aparna. Right. So this is, uh, you know, particularly useful in uh, tribal communities in remote areas where there is wastewater infrastructure, but perhaps, you know, people are apprehensive about just going in to get testing. The COVID pandemic itself really highlighted, you know, the failures in just basic infrastructure in tribal communities uh, when it comes to water and wastewater. And so at for, as a researcher, we first had to address that, you know, where could we, you know, implement this type of study? And then, you know, how can that either complement clinical data or how can it be used in the absence of clinical data? 
So, you know, quite a bit of background research, you know, had to be developed before we actually started uh, working with tribal communities. Okay. And a part of that, I, I remember way back at the beginning of the pandemic when we were first, re- uh, I was working with you on putting something on our website about the use of wastewater epidemiology and surveillance for, for the pandemic. And you were excited about the, the sort of the, the potential advantages or the ways that this could complement the, the data that we were getting from individual tests. Could, what were, if you could expand upon that, like what, what did you see as the opportunity in terms of offering something different that compared to the, the, you know, the, the kind of individual swabs that unfortunately we've become too accustomed to in the past couple of years? Yeah, I think for rural communities, there's there's two key advantages, and and this aligns with what Otek was saying as well. So, in poorer rural communities that aren't well connected to healthcare systems, a lack of means, a lack of transportation, or lack of time can make it really difficult to get a clinical test. And so, because wastewater surveillance doesn't require people to present for testing for their infection to be registered, it's an incredibly valuable complementary data source. And it's one that also captures asymptomatic infections, which clinical testing doesn't. Um, Secondarily, the fact that wastewater surveillance taps into existing infrastructure, not not just kind of the, the sewer system, the pipes, but also sampling that's done daily at wastewater treatment plants across the country to assess water quality has helped it thrive in rural regions. Um, that's in part because rural communities need to be more self-sufficient. So they are, they're less visible, right, than their urban counterparts. They're not featured on the nightly news, you know, in the same way that New York City might be. And, you know, if you look at kind of New York City versus rural communities in the early days of the pandemic, New York received tremendous assistance. So there were military medical teams deployed to area hospitals. Doctors and nurses flew across the country to support pandemic response there. And, you know, a lot of rural communities didn't receive that same level of support when SARS-CoV-2 first entered their region. And not only that, but people emptied out of the cities and came to Western North Carolina. They came to rural regions because it's easier to social distance because it's, you know, beautiful (laughs) here. And so that increased the risk for COVID transmission and the potential strain on systems here. Um, And so not only are they not getting the same level of support, you know, they're also being kind of overly strained because of that mass exodus from the cities into rural communities. Nataki, what about in Atlanta? Have have you seen, I know you said that it's a more nascent, it's an, uh, the, the effort is earlier on in terms of wastewater and water testing there, but uh, at least at, in terms of what the potential could be, do you see there being opportunities to uh, to help where there is limited or inequitable access to individual tests? I definitely think there's a lot of potential in using this wastewater surveillance data in a place like Atlanta. You know, we've, we've seen an ebb and flow in terms of availability of, you know, diagnostic testing sites. When we're in these, you know, surges, there tend to be, you know, multiple opportunities, maybe, you know, a testing site on any given corner, you know, within the city or in definitely in certain parts of the community. Um, but as those case numbers go down just a little bit, you see some of the um, some of the accessibility waning just a bit. And if I think back really to the beginning um, stages of the pandemic, you know, the communities who really most needed diagnostic testing just didn't have access to it. While that has changed, you know, over time, you know, there's still that that potential that, you know, this sort of data can stand in the gap. Uh, when those testing resources are not as readily available. We know it costs you know, money to keep these testing facilities going. Um, people aren't charged for the testing. And so you know, over time, there is a considerable you know, cost associated with things. And so you know, when you do that cost benefit analysis, that might mean that some, some sites close up and, and don't reopen. So there is that potential to be able to use this data to help you know, better understand you know, what's happening in terms of you know, positivity rates in our local community. Okay, excellent. Nataki, I want to stick with you for a second, and I'm, I'm going to ask you to do a little definitional work here as well. Um, I want to talk a little bit about environmental justice communities and what waste, wastewater testing would mean for them. And, you know, 
both you know how it might empower environmental justice communities but also how it could potentially threaten or marginalize them and first if you could just give give listeners who aren't familiar with that term what what do we mean or what should they have in mind when they're thinking about an environmental justice community when I speak of environmental justice communities, um, and, and other people call them sometimes environmentally overburdened communities, I'm thinking about those communities that are disproportionately impacted um, by exposure to environmental toxicants, hazards, and stressors. I think that it's it's also important to recognize as we talk about, you know, COVID-19, you know, prevalence across the country, uh, COVID-19 hospitalizations and deaths, you know, many of these same communities who we call or consider to be environmental justice communities have been hardest hit in terms of, of COVID, you know, cases, hospitalizations, and, and even deaths. So I also would maybe lift up, you know, this idea. Sometimes in public health, we talk about the social determinants of health, you know, the conditions that people are born into, that they grow up in and, and live in that, you know, also impact health status. You know, so we, we're, we're talking, uh, we're moving beyond, you know, biological factors, but, you know, things related to, you know, income level, um, geography, place, you know, where one might live and what they might be exposed to in that community or even in a work environment. Uh, so when we talk about environmental justice communities, we're talking about these communities who have been made to be vulnerable because of a wide variety of factors. And, and these are the communities who I think can benefit uh, from use of this wastewater surveillance data, when you talk about, you know, this data helping to be that early warning sign of what's happening in communities, especially in the absence of having, you know, a significant amount of diagnostic testing data. I think it's really up to those communities, um, you know, with their sense of self self-determination to determine uh, or to decide how this how this data is used and how they can, you know, use it to push for the types of changes that they need to see happen, whether we're talking about, you know, more resources that are focused on things like diagnostic testing or, or whatever um, the communities deem as being most important in terms of um, how this pandemic is impacting them. So I think that potential is there, um, but the communities really have to be at the table uh, themselves. Um, they have to be bought in. Um, and it has to be a process of, you know, kind of co-discovery um, per and perhaps co-creation, you know, of the strategies that, you know, can be most protective of communities. You know, so having researchers and universities, academics, whoever is engaged in this wastewater surveillance, you know, really needs to partner in a very authentic way with those communities. It doesn't sound too different in principle from what Otak was saying about the needs to be building authentic and strong relationships with the community. She was talking about in terms of tribal communities, but it sounds like the same principles would apply here. And also in terms of making sure the data is being used in a way that the, the, the original sort of generators or owners of that data would feel comfortable. Yeah, I think it, uh, there are definitely are a lot of similarities. So, you know, communities want to be you know, at the center of this process. And, and while, you know, a lot of our environmental justice communities, if they are not tribal communities, may not have, you know, their own policies around uh, data sovereignty, more and more, I am seeing, you know, the development of these, you know, kind of community IRBs, if you will, um, where communities are beginning to be uh, very savvy about the research that is conducted within their borders uh, and very, you know, intentional about, um, from from the outset, you know, talking about ownership of the data, um, how that data is used, and, you know, they're looking for outcomes beyond, you know, publishing academic papers, you know, but it's all about, you know, how can we change policy, how can we change practice in a way that improves health outcomes. Okay, thank you, Nataki. Aparna, I want to turn back to you now. We've talked a bit about the expansion of wastewater testing and the potential of wastewater testing, but we haven't figured everything out yet. What are the challenges with reporting and analyzing wastewater today? And what can be done to address those challenges? Yeah, so wastewater surveillance for, for COVID has been underway for you know one to two years now, but there's still this huge need to translate the data into simple metrics that can inform public health action. Data streams are improving, 
And so public health officials now have several indicators they can routinely review, but each of these indicators has its own bias, has its own limitation. And so what that means is that they don't always align to tell the same story. And so the challenge is how do you unite these different data sources to give officials a, a more comprehensive and holistic picture of risk and how that risk is changing over time. And so Mathematica and some of the uh, Rockefeller grantees are developing a multi-indicator risk score that synthesizes wastewater data with other public health data sources. And, you know, we're in the process of defining these new metrics and validating them on large data sets to determine if they're really robust across different types of communities and communities that range in demographics, size, and the methods that you, they're using for wastewater sampling and testing. So really kind of that, that focus on reporting, there's, there's been a lot of work around validation of lab methods, but less attention paid to how do you use that data once you have it in hand. Okay, that's interesting. I, I, I remember in a paper that you uh, published last year, one of the points you made was that there, or that you and your co-authors made was it's been great that there are so many communities across the country that are now doing wastewater testing for COVID-19, but that there, it's almost as if there are hundreds of pilots, but they're not all kind of using the same practices. If we want to get to sort of a national system that can work going forward, they've got to get more on the same page. That's right. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's still more to be done to figure out how do you, how do you scale this up in a way that, you know, there's, there's equal access, there's equal opportunity. A lot of the early success stories came out of places that had a university researcher that was a specialist nearby, right? That that happened to specialize in virology or, or uh, environmental engineering and was doing wastewater surveillance already. And that kind of put those communities at an unfair advantage, which is maybe okay early on. But as CDC and NHHS kind of scale this up and develop a national wastewater surveillance system, it's important to make sure that communities that might not have that specialized knowledge nearby also um, are included in, in kind of the wastewater surveillance systems that get developed. So, yeah, I think it's I think it's kind of figuring out, are these data kind of representative? Are the right are they being studied in the right communities and diverse communities across the country? And then are the data being reported in a way that people who don't have specialized knowledge of virology and, and viral concentrations, you know, can they make sense of this data to quickly act on it and, and to guide pandemic response? The last question I wanted to ask, and this one, this question is really to the group. As wastewater testing becomes a more prominent public health tool for monitoring and managing infectious disease prevalence in the United States, and that goes beyond the current, the current pandemic, what needs to change to make sure it benefits everybody? Otak, do you want to start us off? So uh, when we were analyzing which tribes can use this type of surveillance, uh, we went through the EPA database and uh, special wastewater permits. We found that only 100 out of 574 tribes um, have the infrastructure to do this type of work. But even with that, it will take you know, additional work on the researcher's part to navigate the tribe's research policies, to figure out where, uh, where's the best place to sample, you know, how can we you know, build up the uh, staffing uh, within tribal communities to do this type of work if they're interested. And also uh, for the tribes that I'm working with, even just you know collecting samples is is difficult. There, the distances are far. We have to fly places, and they don't really have uh, you know auto samplers built into their infrastructure, which I, I think would definitely uh, help elevate this type of work. Um, so it really is uh, you know working with the tribe to uh, leverage this work. And for for folks who might not know exactly what auto samplers are, I mean, I have I, I can kind of guess based on the name, but what is auto sampling and why why might that be a benefit to have? Right. So the standard is uh, for wastewater surveillance is to use a type of robot to, that pulls from the wastewater uh, sewer line or from the headworks of a treatment plant over twenty four hours. Um, so that's really the standard 
but uh, tribal wastewater infrastructure is different. Most facilities are lagoons and we cannot sample from a lagoon. So we are out in the field upstream of the lagoon, like popping manholes and installing these uh, auto samplers in the sewer line. There are some tribes that um, you know, have nicer refrigerated, they're located in sheds or structures, um, have auto samplers there. Um, and I think uh, just doing that would help a lot of tribes, particularly the ones that have embraced um, wastewater-based epidemiology. Okay, great. Aparna, how can, we, how can we make sure that the future of wastewater testing benefits everybody? Yeah, building on what Otik mentioned about not all tribes being connected to a sewer system, no one's really been looking at whether communities connected to a sewer system differ in important ways from those not connected. You know, what is the generalizability of this data? And so we're starting to explore that now in North Carolina in collaboration with the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, we're, we're comparing the demographics of sewered and unsewered populations to see you know, are there still some population groups that remain overlooked because of a lack of sewage infrastructure? Um, wastewater surveillance is better than clinical testing in, in the fact that it covers broad swaths of the country, but 25% of Americans are still um, not connected to a sewer system and they're underrepresented in this data or, or not represented. And is it important? I mean, it is important, I think, to know who these 25% of Americans are. So that's one. And then Secondly, I would say that as CDC funds states to build the capacity for wastewater testing, so not all labs have the methods in place to process wastewater samples, which present unique challenges compared to clinical samples. So as state labs build capacity, um, it's important to make sure that, that rural communities have access to those types of labs and, and the specialist knowledge needed so that it's not just the urban centers that happen to have, you know, that university researcher or state lab in the capital, but also communities on the outskirts, that they also have an equal chance to participate in these types of systems and surveillance. What would you say, Nataki? For this type of data to benefit everyone, you know, I think that those who have the potential to be most impacted just have to be at the table. While we look at wastewater surveillance as something that is passive, um, we've already discussed, you know, ways that especially, you know, if we if we go beyond, you know, COVID-19, which is, you know, pretty you know, prevalent throughout our society. Um, when we begin to look at other things, um, there is that potential for communities to be stigmatized and to be marginalized. And so making sure that those community voices are at the table talking about you know, how this data is collected, you know, who owns the data, how it's used is going to be critical. You know, it seems for, for many, it may be a novel or very innovative thing, but I don't think that we quite know enough. Uh, I don't think that we've delved enough into any sort of ethical framework uh, around this sort of activity. And, you know, we need to ask some of those, you know, hard questions and and, and delve into this, you know, from that perspective. But I think having those diverse voices at the table is part of the key to making sure that we cover uh, and really, you know, explore the issues that, that need to be explored um, to ensure that this is something that can actually be beneficial for all uh, and harmful for no one. Thanks to my guests, Otak Conroy Ben, Nataki Osborne Jelks, and Aperna Keshavaya. In the show notes, I'll include additional resources you can read to learn more about the Wastewater Action Group, as well as other efforts by the Rockefeller Foundation and Mathematica to address the COVID-19 pandemic. As always, thank you for listening to On the Evidence. There are a few ways you can keep up with the show. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also learn about new episodes by following us on Twitter. I'm at JB Wogan. Mathematica is at Mathematica Now.